not all magical traditions are open. Not all mystical traditions are open. Not all spiritual paths are open. Not all religions are open. What do I mean by that? Sometimes there are certain practices that if you are not a part of a tradition, you probably shouldn't be accessing. I know that can be hard for us sometimes, especially when somebody else did the plundering and we don't know. We would like to talk today, like we like to do, about having right relationship with our kindred practitioners throughout the world and how to, we can actually decolonize our magic. Walk with me, if you will, down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie, I am a Christo Pagan Druid and Priest of Grigid. Hello everyone, I am Brian, I am a Christo Pagan Druid and sous chef to the Dagda. We're going to be talking about decolonization and cultural appropriation, and yes, you're right, we have talked about this before, but I've seen the discourse happening at the end, I recently read a book that got me fired up about this, so we're going to talk about it again. But in a lot more detail this time, we kind of did the 101 earlier. If you haven't, if you haven't listened to that one already, you go back on the podcast and check it out. But we're going to deal with this one today. But before we do, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on whatever app you're listening to us on. We do original Christo Pagan and Druid content five days a week on this podcast, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss anything because we got a lot of things planned. I'm not going to say the name of the book because I don't want to call anybody out because that's not what I am here to do. I am opposed to call out culture and please do not become a part of that whole you're doing it wrong brigade that are out there. That is not what I'm trying to do here. That's not what I'm trying to encourage here today. That's why I'm not going to say the author or the book that I was reading. Part of that stems out of the very firm stoic beliefs where you can only fix that which you can fix. You can only work on that which you can work on. And that is yourself. That's what's in your control. And so calling out somebody else that is not fixing yourself. Now, if you're using it as an example for self-reflection and self-improvement, okay. I do not know if this person is living in right relationship or not. But when I was reading this person's book, so I'm trying to even be gender neutral. It's hard to discern who I'm talking about here. When I was reading this person's book, they went on a very long, almost entire chapter about how they love smudging and how they love using white sage. I know that this is a white person who wrote this book. I have issues with that personally, because this is something that is very sacred to a lot of First Nations and Native American tribal groups and tribal practice throughout the United States and Canada. It is something that has been co-opted from them often without their permission and often against their objections where they, many of these groups have asked us to stop doing it. Now, having said that, I do not know if this person has a relationship with any groups that may have granted them permission to do this practice. It is one that kind of sends up a white flag of, wait a minute, I need to check this out. The more this person talked about it, the more that flag turned yellow, they didn't quite get to red. But it made me suspicious of whether or not they even knew that this was a colonized practice. And that is something we need to be better about because magic is about intention. Magic is our intentional use of the subtle energies of the world. And if our intentions are not well formed, our magic will not be either. If we are using stolen magical technologies, I personally believe that it will affect the outcome of our orgy. That does not mean that you cannot still use incense. Incense is a common practice throughout the world. Druidic practice very often would actually burn uh, juniper berries and various other leaves for their magic, depending on what they were doing, time of the year. It's a very complicated thing. But there, there are other practices beyond white sage. I get it. Some people really love the smell of burning white sage. Most people do not know that this practice has been taken from a group that we are still actively committing a genocide against in the United States and Canada. It really set me on edge and took me a while to get back into the book when this practice went, was discussed without any discussion of being in right relationship to the indigenous populations or any of that. 
None of that got brought up at all. That's the ground floor of not culturally appropriating any of the work that we're trying to do is that we are doing everything in our power to live in right relationship with the groups that created the symbols, the metaphors, the practices that we are adopting. So I very freely use a lot of Buddhist imagery in a lot of my work. I practiced Buddhism for quite some time. I converted to Buddhism for quite some time. Buddhism is not a closed religion. There are closed religions within Buddhism, closed sects of Buddhism, but most of the Buddhist teachers that I had and the ones that I'm drawing on were very much like, use the spiritual technology to make your lives better. They, they didn't really care if you were a Buddhist and if you were Jewish or Muslim, they, they didn't really care. Here is technology that will make your life better and help get everybody on the path to enlightenment. That's the school that I practiced in and that I learned in. And so those teachers gave kind of a carte blanche permission to those who are listening to their teachings, reading their books and what have you to continue to use that in their practice, even if it is not a strictly Buddhist practice. That is where I come from that. That's living in right relationship. Permission was granted. When I talk a lot about Jesus and Buddha, I get that from Thich Nhat Hanh. And Thich Nhat Hanh was very, very much like, I don't care if you're a Christian or if you're a B Buddhist, here are the similarities. Here's how they work together. Here's how I've found Jesus and put Jesus in my, on my altar. And Jesus is one of the people that I pray to when I prayed. And here's some of the Christians that I've worked with who have had relations with the Buddha. You see what I'm saying? There is a, a free flow back and forth between these faiths. Okay. We need to be mindful about other practices. I was also watching a video with somebody the other day and they used the term spirit animal and I cringed so hard that I kind of had a crick in my neck. This is another Native American practice that was taken. Now, I think we do encounter animal spirits. I feel that my, one of my main guides is an animal spirit. Actually, two technically, if you consider mythological creatures animal spirits. Oh, and also when you're working with set forms and some of those other spiritual practices and stuff that comes up as well, where you, your thanks would be animal spirit in that sense, but that is different. The term spirit animal is very much from this indigenous way of thinking. Most of the people listening to my voice are probably not indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Your people did not come out of the land, if you will. But if they are welcome, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. If yeah. you're not talking to you. Yeah. I'm talking to my mostly white siblings, sisters, and brothers out there who have issues with us. And the biggest problem is I think a lot of us don't even know what we are saying and what we are doing and how we are appropriating other faiths in our practice because it has been obfuscated from us. Because somebody did it a long time ago and we haven't, we didn't know that they did it. That's also why at this point in the conversation, I like to take that moment where if you are feeling a lot of discomfort, if that fight or flight is kicking in, probably take, take out a journal or something, make a little note for yourself, because there is something in that root of that discomfort that is work that you should be doing on yourself. As we talked about yesterday and going into those dark places, that's one of those dark places where you, you need to have that hunt. It's not comfortable. Oops. And sometimes at the end of that journey, you may find out that you had, you could say, unmerited blame or guilt or whatever those feelings were from a, a false or illusory source, and that'll allow you to let it go so that you don't have to live with it. Remember, I'm not calling anyone a bad person. Yeah, there is no You're not a this. bad person yeah. if this is something that you have taken part in, if it's something that even means something to you. When I was getting into magic in the 90s, the first thing you were taught to do was how to light up a smudge stick. Yeah. Like that was just, it was just hi, part we're of doing it. magic, we get a clean this face, here's a bundle of white sage, here's how to light it, here's how to keep it going, and here's how to go around this face. That's just how we were taught. It wasn't until many years later that somebody pointed out, you know, this is a Native American practice. I was like, oh, it is. And then they're like, and you know, they've asked people not to do it. Oh, I did not know that. And so in our own practice, we have started using things that mean more to us. I actually had moved on. I find dragon's blood incense to be very cleansing for me. Not everybody agrees with that. And that's fine. You, remember, those associations are just that. They're associations. They're not 
magical laws of the universe. If you find patchouli incense or oil to be very cleansing and relaxing, then use patchouli, right? Honestly, if you like the, the sage, just get a sage incense and you can burn that as an incense. And there you go. I mean, it's, it's you know. Or ask yourself, what are you or, doing back to the Native American tradition? Yeah. What are you, how are you helping these people who are still going through we're putting them through a lot. If you are American or Canadian, we're putting them through a lot. Yeah. You need to, especially if you found yourself appropriating any Native American practices, yet yeah, look into it. We, we are not doing well by these populations. We are still really harming them. If you're living in a right relationship, then part of that is you are keeping their sacred things still sacred. And they're, a lot of the ones I've talked with, they're, they're cool. Yeah. Once again, that is on a personal journey that's making sure you're in right relationship. How do you figure out if you were appropriate? Because I think this comes up a lot because when we start talking about this and we start this process of decolonization, a lot of these questions come up. I, I face this a lot because one of my favorite writers is Dion Fortune. Mm. And Dion Fortune was a woman of her era in many ways. It's important for me to remember that she is, what, a late Victorian, early 20th century with, she used so many words for herself, magician. I think would be the most common one that she used, occultist. But she was very locked into her time. She ascribes to things that I, she was very involved in theosophy. I don't believe in Atlantis as a real place. I just don't. I, I don't believe Atlantis, Lemuria, any of that is real. But that does not mean that I throw all of her, well, all of her stuff out. She also liberally bar borrows ideas from Vedanta, which was very popular in that kind of early 20th century time period, uh, which is one of the many Hindu practices. And I have to question those anytime she's using this terminology. She, for example, refers to Kabbalah as the yoga of the West. That's a good sign that you may need to do some questioning of your sources on whether or not something's being colonized there. Come on, it's not the yoga of the West. It isn't. I understand what she meant by this term. And in a lot of ways, I don't disagree with what she meant by this term, but I would not use that in my current teaching or practice. So you start seeing these words that are from other cultures, other practices, and they make you go, hmm, that's a good sign that maybe you need to look at where did this come from? Somebody's claiming that a practice is super ancient. Anytime oh, yeah. somebody's claiming that something is super ancient, uh, I've noticed a lot of stuff going around about the grimoire of St. Cyprian lately. St. Cyprian, real person, lived in the third century, was not a wizard. Sorry to break it to everybody. The grimoire that does exist, it is a real book, was written in the 1700s in Spain. Maybe Portugal. Probably Spain. Somewhere on the Iberian Peninsula. It is not ancient. It is not old. It preserves various ideas that have been floating around. It is kind of a consolidation of ideas. But to try to pretend that it is something older, it is not. Now, it does seem to have in it some folk practices from the region. There are a lot of people claiming that it is super old. Yeah, if you're dealing with magic and somebody says it's super old, unless they are from an indigenous community, don't believe them. They're, they're probably not telling you the truth. If they can cite an old source, a legitimate old source, there are a lot of things that pretend to be old sources. Like, I love the Lesser Key of Solomon and some of the other stories around Solomonic magic. That's medieval at best. That does not go back to Solomon. Not really ancient. Well, it's depending on what, where your cutoff for ancient is. But you need to start looking into what are the sources of this, where is this coming from? Because knowledge, especially in magic and mysticism, really is power. Where is this coming from? Where are they drawing these ideas from? Because it is very common, especially in of true and even including the 20th century, for people to backdate their magical and the school experiences to saints, gods, angels, spirits that preceded them. Well, be skeptical of all of that. Because I think the biggest thing that saves us when we are struggling with this colonization that's going on is we have this idea that older is better. And I say this all the time to the fact that it's a mantra on the channel. Better is better. Better is better. 
And a lot of that stems out of, as we've said before, this old Roman prejudice thought construct that has been passed down generation after generation after generation for multi-millennia now that we have inherited where ancient is mighty and powerful. And it's like part of that decolonizing is recognizing that, oh, this thought construct that I've inherited, <laughs> that generations before me have in inherited, that I know at least from my people inherited from multiple continents way before that, from the, going back to Roman time, that is wrong. And, and just, once again, sitting with it, accepting it, and letting it go. Sometimes we need to bear in mind that the mixture is so baked into the cookies that we can't separate it back out. It's not like that there are nuts on top of the brownies, you can just trick them off. Sometimes yeah. it's really baked in. It's like when you accidentally put too much salt into something, it's in there. Because when we really start doing this decolonization work, you start realizing how much goes back to the Greco-Roman papyri, how much goes back to the Greco-Roman practice, and then into the mishmash that was Alexandrian everything. Alexandria, Egypt was the place where all ideas kind of met, merged, danced together, and had babies. And so a lot of our magical practices that do have these roots going all the way back, it may be obscured through layers and layers of revision and change, but most of our magic, magical thought goes all the way back to this time period where it's hard to know who was appropriating from who. You don't have to get bent out of shape about it. What was original Egyptian content? What was Greek content? What was Roman? There's a certain point where, like I said, it gets so baked in that it, 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 it can't be weeded back out without starting again from scratch. It's one of those three times where I'm comfortable with just the general term of Western because it really is at that point. Cause it's like, you can't really pinpoint where it's just, it's a Western thought. Well, we to the like, point where we just don't know how it got, how it, how it got, got how the yeah, mixture because of everything happening down over the time. Because you also have to remember that as that was passed down from Alexandria into the, fu into the future where we are today, there were many periods of witch hunts and, other persecutions where the, those practices got hidden or obfuscated or or lost and picked back up and refound and rethought of and reworked and over and over and over and reborrowed from. We also have to remember that there's a lot out there that we do not have access to. Justin Sledge and Dick Dan Attell just published a wonderful new translation of a bunch of previously unavailable in English or in scholarly edition works of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. And Agrippa is seminal in my mind because he was the textbook. When I was learning magic, I was I got a, was told to get a copy of Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy and study them. They, they, they were the textbook that I learned from. And I wasn't alive back then. Information about him was shoddy, especially when I was learning because it was pre-internet. For, for who we have for all of it, um, in those early years. Um, and so I didn't know that there was all of this unpublished stuff from him, including a refutation of magic that he wrote that is really interesting to read in what he says and what he doesn't say. I like to call it his get out of inquisition free car that he wrote some of his mystical writings that I had never known about. He has become a very complicated and interesting person because of what we do not know that we now that now has come to light and highly recommend the book if you're interested in hermeticism at all fascinating read really has impacted a lot of my thinking about a lot of issues but none more than how i conceive of agrippa as a writer mystic and magician you have to realize that there is this we talked about this cloud of unknowing yesterday on the podcast Anytime we're dealing with our traditions, there is this great cloud of unknowing where we don't know where a lot of our stuff comes from. How much of it is just from the spiritualist movement of the 17 and 1800s? How much of it is American folk magic? Because there was a lot of American folk magic. It was very much a thing that was alive and well, and is still alive and well. You've walked into a house and they had a horseshoe over the door. That's a mixture of 
a lot of different cultures that came together to make this American folk magic tradition, but primarily from the Scot Scots and the Irish that brought that to us. So it can be hard to weed out what is what. Some of the scrying that we do, where does that originally come from? So don't get yourself lost in the weeds with any of that, but do be curious where your work is coming from because there's no reason to cause offense if no offense needs to be caused. Also, for those who have been practicing longer, it may make them a little bit dubious of your words. Like I said, when I'm reading this book from a person that I thought would be an interesting person to read their perspective on, and to suddenly have this literal chapter of the book dedicated to, oh, how I love smudging. An entire chapter, and not one smudging in anything else. We cast circles because our ancestors cast circles. The circle is a tool. This is something I think we all need to start realizing about magic. Magic is a collection of spiritual technologies. None of it has to happen. If you don't like casting circles, you do not have to cast circles. I would say if you're e evoking spirits, circles are really important, but enter at your own risk, there'll be dragons there. But you don't have to do that. That is a spiritual technology that has a specific purpose. The same with smudging. If any of these practices once you get more adept in the work, you will be able to start seeing the parts and why, why we're doing the things. Why, why this, why that? Why do we walk around an altar three times? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And once you start understanding that, you can start playing around with it and making it yours. Your job is not to be a parrot of the past. It's to take in the learning and to make a vibrant and powerful practice for yourself and for your community. If you're a part of a coven or a grove or any of the likes, right? If you are building a community, your community should have its own flavor of magic and will eventually have one. You're not just here to regurgitate unless you're a specific type of Wiccan that co copies the book of shadows by hand in every generation and passes it down that there are traditions like that. More power to you, you to you. But as you're learning, just take them apart. What is it about those sage that you like? Is it just the wafting of smoke? Is it the ritual aspect of it? Is it the scent? What is it about it that you like? Because everybody uses incense, like I said earlier. I'm just fixating on this one because it's such an obvious example. But once you've, you're able to take apart the spiritual psychology, you can put it back together. I love frank frankincense and myrrh. I love rose incenses. I love dragon's blood incenses. There are a lot of different types of incense that I just absolutely love. I know I like to use incense smoke to clean an area. I also really like using bells. Yeah. Intoning sound. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's that Pam me or from the office, right? It's they're the same picture, but you see, get to see they're the same picture as you're uncovering the spiritual technology and all of its moving parts. We are using either sound or smoke or light. Some people will wander around with a candle, but we're designating this as sacred space. This is clean space. This is refresh. What, what has those meanings for you? That's what you should be walking around with. Because this isn't about casting blame or aspersions, which is why I'm not naming the book or the person that triggered me. But it's about learning to understand the moving parts of the spiritual technologies we're using and improving them to be ours. I don't know. I hope you enjoyed this. This is one that I feel like I'm walking on eggshells every time we talk about. Was... It is a delicate balance because we want to inform and we want to help the individual in their practice and in their daily life. And it's also difficult because for the listener, it's easy to give in to those instincts of fight or flight, to apply guilt or shame or one of those other destructive emotions to themselves and give in to the constructs. <laughs> and that's not what we're here for. And that's all we're here for. That's all we're about. We're, we're here to make everything better. And part, part of that is, you know, I really you do believe like we should be doing no harm. And if we can't do no harm, we should at least do as little harm as possible. And the reason I say that is because there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. There just isn't. We're all doing a little bit of harm, but we're doing as much harm reduction as we possibly can is best start examining your life see what it is that you can bring in what you can't do without and then take it apart if you want us to do an episode 
on spiritual technology and how to get to this kind of tinker way that I tend to think about magic and spell work and ritual work, we can do that. Just let me know. You leave a comment and down below if you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, anywhere else, even if they say you can leave a comment, you can leave one there because engagement is magical, but they don't tell us that you did it, so we won't know. So head over to creationspaths.com, click on chat, and you can leave a comment there and we will see it and be able to respond to you. Because I would love to know what practices are you decolonizing for yourself? What practice, What practices are you struggling to let go of? Because you found out that they were taken maybe without the permission of the group or culture that they were taken from. Look, I think it would be a fascinating thing. I've talked about some of mine. I don't know. I think once we destigmatize the we're learning and getting better part of this process, easier it will be to do the whole rest of the thing. So anyway, while you're over at creationspaths.com, if you can and you would like to, you can think about joining and becoming a member. You can also support us on Patreon or Kofi. I am CEO Dorset on both. That money goes to help us keep the lights on, keep a roof over our head, and keep food on the table. I'm going to close with a prayer to St. Michael. Oh, St. Michael, Archangel of Compassion, whose secret name was Metatron. Come to us now in this time while we are discerning right from wrong and discerning the paths that we should walk. Teach us the gentle guidance that we need to have compassion with ourselves and others, and teach us when we need to use the flaming sword to strike through and cut off relationships that need to end. Amen. Amen. Amen.